about um, I'm Charles Obanya of the Society of the Missionaries of Africa and a member of Justice and Peace Commission of the Archdiocese of Liverpool. Let us take a moment of silence and prayer before we start our assembly. Lord God, bless our virtual assembly, which brings us together as brothers and sisters from near and far. We come together at this time when your people are struggling to understand the many challenges and threats we face today. You said, see, I am making all things new. We ask you to renew the world. We pray for good relationships among peoples of different identities, good relationships among nations, and we pray for international cooperation. Grant us, your children, the wisdom and courage to participate in your work. You who instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us the same Holy Spirit to join with us throughout this assembly. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And thank you for joining us tonight for our Monday See I Am Making All Things New, Just and Peace Assembly Talk on our Christian response to the COVID-19 crisis. Tonight's talk is from Dermot Amerchi. Dermot is a priest, a member of the Sacred Heart Ministry Order and a graduate of Trinity College, Dublin. He is also a social psychologist, with his working life being in social ministry, predominantly in London. Dermot has written about 20 published books, such as Religious Life in the 21st Century, Quantum Theology, Reclaiming Spirituality, and Jesus and the Power of Poetry. As a social psychologist, Dermot has worked as a couples counsellor, in bereavement work, in AIDS HIV counselling, and in more recent times with homeless people and refugees. As a workshop leader and group facilitator, he has worked in Europe, the USA, Canada, Australia, the Philippines, Thailand, India, and in several African countries, where he facilitated programs on adult faith development. He now lives in Dublin. Tonight, we'll examine COVID-19 through the eyes of justice and spirituality, examining the new challenges of a spirituality VK justice. We hope you enjoy this inspiring talk and are able to take something of value away from it. Thank you and enjoy. Greetings friends, first my thanks to Steve and all the other people that were involved in organising this gathering and who have invited me to speak to you on the topic of COVID-19, justice and spirituality, new challenges for a spirituality of eco-justice. You have a two-page handout which I will be following um, as I go through this very brief uh, presentation. So this virus began in China, in the province of Hubei and in the city of Wuhan, a city we're told of 11 million people. And according to the records and what the scientists have been telling us, bats, which are the creatures you can see here in this picture, were at least the initial carriers and maybe indeed the main carriers of the virus, um, who then transmitted it to other birds or animals or mammals, and from there on to humans. This highly contagious virus that we're now dealing with. The conditions in these wet markets have been commented on by several uh, commentators and analysts. The birds are often treated in a very pressurized and stressful way, and often taken out of their habitat and kept out of it and in rather false conditions for long periods of time. 
I believe they carry the virus from a very young stage of their lives. And that does not present a problem until they're under these very stressful, pressurized conditions, in which case the virus begins coming out through their bodies, is passed on to other creatures, and eventually affects us humans. The major um, issue at stake here is called zoonotic spillover. And you can see briefly in this picture from the birds to animals to humans or sometimes directly from the uh, mammals to humans and on to other humans. Already in 2012, this scientist, David Quammen from America, wrote a book specifically on this issue of spillover and describes in great detail uh, the rather difficult um, situations and circumstances to which these creatures are subjected and then the impact it has on us humans. It begins to feel almost like these creatures are standing up for themselves and punishing us for some of the awful things we have done to them. But it's not just uh, the, these particular birds or mammals, it's in the wider picture as well as you'll see from what's written at the bottom of the screen. We start cutting down trees for timber. We build timber camps. We build mining camps. We harvest the wild animals further to feed the laborers in the timber camps and the mining camps. Or we capture the wild animals and ship them away, live or dead, to be consumed by other people elsewhere. And doing all that, we disrupt not merely the wild ecosystems, but a whole range of other systems that have then left us with this particular crisis. And indeed, as the crisis is going on, and, and even from very early stages, there were huge indications that wrong human interference, or what we might call unjust human interference, is a major factor in this crisis that we're now enduring. So the problem it would seem is not with the bats themselves or other animals or birds, but with money-driven human exploitation and the appalling ignorance of the ecological equilibrium upon which all life flourishes. Therefore, the most cost-effective way to protect humans is not by discovering new vaccines, and that can be a good in itself, but by humans themselves learning to protect all life forms within their um, authentic ecological niches. And that's one of the reasons why I have that word eco-justice in the title of this presentation. In the light of this crisis, justice is no longer about humans, about human rights or about human issues. As Laudato C makes very clear, all justice today has to become eco-justice. Justice that embraces and includes the big challenges of creation and the several ecological and environmental issues that are a feature of our time. The next picture I'm showing you, and you will have seen this um, probably on several web pages already. Um, these are two pictures of the city of Wuhan. The one to the left taken before the crisis arose at all. And you can see, as is the, has been the case in several cities of China, huge smog. The, the picture on the right taken about uh, five or six weeks after the crisis began, and you can see it's clear daylight and all the smog has lifted. And so the writing on the screen, as the virus raged in Wuhan province, severe restrictions for travel were put in place. In a matter of a few weeks, the smog lifted and people could see the blue sky again. Birds returned to their favorite habitats and fishes to all streams. Now that humans had to recede from their anthropocentric drivenness, Earth could once more reclaim its innate organicity. It's almost like the crisis is forcing us to reclaim our legitimate place in the scheme of things. We are part and parcel of an Earth ecosystem. We're not the masters, we're not in control, we're not in charge. We're servants to a wisdom 
greater than our own. And of course, the challenges of that then uh, become apparently clear in the guidelines given by the WHO from the very beginning. The solution is in our hands. It was fascinating to watch where the leaders of the world and the leading medical experts and the scientific experts were saying, in the absence of a vaccine, the only way we can contain this virus in terms of its threat to humans is by humans themselves learning a whole new set of living skills, the social distancing, the hygienic measures, and so forth. It was almost like the people with the power were saying, despite the power we have, we're not in charge here anymore. If, if humans are to be in charge, then it's over to you, the ordinary rank and file people. This is an amazing moment if we as a species can only learn how to seize it, how, how to work with it, and how to reclaim and rediscover a most important feature of our well being, our health, our wholeness, and the justice that is required for a better quality of life for every creature inhabiting the planet, including ourselves. And the outstanding example for me is in this slide that I'm now showing you. This is Paul Hawken, an American um, historian and sociologist who in the millennial year of 2000 gathered a team of friends and began examining and investigating networks around the world. But they were only looking at one type of network, those which belong pri uh, primarily, uh, exclusively in fact, to ecology, and environment. That's all they were looking at. They adopted a policy that they would not take the group's word for what they were doing. They would visit the project and see that they were doing what they claimed to be doing. They investigated some of the very big ones like Friends of the Earth, uh, World Watch, Greenpeace, and then thousands upon thousands of small local networks, but all making a difference. And this is the point. They hoped to complete the project um, in the year, the millennium year of 2000. By the end of that year, they knew they were onto something much bigger. And to do justice to it, they allowed the process to continue and were fortunate to get the funding to do that and ended up around the end of 2005, they stopped when they had reached the one millionth network. The one millionth network. And that's what's written up in the book, Blessed Unrest, that story. I sat in London with about 100 other people listening to Paul telling us about this in the London School of Economics. And as we approached the end of the input, I could feel an enormous sense of rage going on within myself. And the rage was, why are we not being told about this? Isn't this the good news of the gospel? Isn't this the kingdom of God at work? Isn't this the dream and the vision of Laudato Si? There is so much good happening in our world at the level of the ordinary people doing ordinary things in extraordinary ways. It doesn't hit headlines. It's not sensational enough. Friends, those of us committed to justice work, we need to be looking out for these signs of hope. This is the people's power that's now being returned to us in the light of this virus. Can we seize it? Can we make something really important of this very precious moment? Charles Eisenstein, that you're now looking at in the, in the picture here, um, has highlighted some of the issues of around what I'm now calling health justice. So he says, last year, according to the FAO, 5 million children worldwide died of hunger. Millions were stunted. 51 million, their lives wasted. That is many times more people than have died so far from COVID-19. Yet no government declared a state of emergency. Nor did we see a comparable level of alarm and action around suicide, for example. The mere tip of an iceberg of despair and depression, which kills over a million people a year globally and 50,000 in the United States alone. Are the drug overdoses, 
which killed 70,000 people in the United States, autoimmunity epidemic, which affects 23.5 million people, and, and then obesity, 100 million people, and so on. There are so many serious imbalances in terms of health. What does it mean to care for and look after our health? What does it mean to be more aware of having healthy immune systems, which is one of the issues that this gentleman challenges? If we get the vaccine, it can become a quick cure, and then we forget many of these challenges. But these kind of problems are going to keep recurring. And this is a, the big question and one of the big issues facing us for the future. Another issue, now with so many people working from home, there is the challenge of a new work ethic. And as I've indicated already, our environment and so many um, of the features of our world, things have become healthier, there is less pressure, less traffic, a uh, greater sense of production at one level. And I'm not trying to glamorize here because the working from home is not necessarily everybody's cup of tea. And some of the research shows, in fact, that it can at times diminish productivity and can lead to loneliness and other issues like that. Uh, there is something about working with other people that creates, um, that answers other needs apart from the productivity and the outcomes of the work itself. However, it, it is a new challenge. It's a new moment um, with, with, again, uh, new issues arising in terms of justice. The whole link of the rediscovery of the richness of the um, computer world are what we're now using today, Zoom and other, other modalities of that type, which um, Ilya Delio touches on in her very recent book, Birth of a Dancing Star. She says, we can consider computer technology as part of the wide biological process of emergent complex relationships. Nature constantly creates new connections and computer technology is part of the broader framework of that new interconnectedness. There are a range of issues related to it. Um, I think for one thing, our educational systems need to very quickly move towards educating people on how to use these facilities constructively and creatively and not destructively, as unfortunately many other people do. And I was thrilled, as we look at this slide, to see that on Easter Sunday, uh, Pope Francis uh, raised this issue of a universal basic wage. Here we're into economic justice and the challenges, particularly as so many people are now unemployed or are in danger of losing their jobs, this idea that everybody can have a universal basic wage. This concept has been around for several years. Uh, a man called James Robertson, who was um, an advisor to Harold Wilson when he was British Prime Minister many years ago, um, was one of the big names in Britain exploring this some years back. The challenge of this is that if you give everybody a basic living wage, then you tax much more highly those that have also formal employment, but they're also getting the basic uh, universal wage. Then you cut down government bureaucracy on a massive scale. You actually save money. And this is widely known. This has been tried and tested. Um, and economists all over the world know it. But of course, if you go for it, we get to a level playing field where everybody is much more equal and that doesn't suit the pressures um, that are part and parcel of our capitalistic systems. So um, economic justice is another issue that's arising here um, and will require attention in the light of the challenges of this virus at this time. From these reflections, and I've only touched on a number of them rather quickly, there are four major conclusions that I want to draw to your attention. Number one, we humans are earthlings. This is repeated over and over again in Laudato Si. So much of our traditional spirituality put emphasis on the soul, not on the whole person. And that as creatures with a soul, we were meant to escape from this veil of tears to the fulfillment of a life hereafter. 
we're now having to come to terms of the fact that we're earthlings. And if we're to survive and thrive and flourish as earthlings, we have got to learn to work collaboratively and cooperatively with all the other creatures that share planet Earth with us. To help us to do that, we need to revisit our long human evolving story, which is the story of seven million years. Most of the religions treat us as if we are a species of a mere few thousand years. And that's one of the areas where we're getting things terribly wrong. So there's a whole re-education here. And that re-education is necessary if we want to have solid creative foundations for the call to justice, which is our primary concern um, in terms of the mission of the group that I'm addressing today. Secondly, ours is a derived form of aliveness, not a superior one. We are one among a whole range of other creatures with whom we share the web of life. The book of Genesis is often mistranslated with the idea that we're the masters of creation, leading to the conclusion that the earth and all its resources is a mere commodity there for our use and benefit. We have got to rise above, we have got to outgrow those rather mechanistic ways of understanding things. We have got to come and understand the aliveness, the organicity of the trees, the plants, the animals, the, the bacteria, <clears throat> and learn to work creatively with those organisms and those creatures as collaborators in a project together. Thirdly, our primary role is to be egalitarian cooperators and not brutal competitors. From a very young age, we're indoctrinating our children to be fierce competitors. We've got to try and rise above that, transcend that consciousness, and work more towards our primary call to be egalitarian cooperators, not merely with other human beings, but as I've already said, with everything that forms part and parcel of the cosmic and planetary web of life. And lastly, we must shed our religious arrogance with its strong patriarchal bias. All the major religions, not merely Christianity that we know today, evolved over the past 5,000 years in the shadow of patriarchal domination following an event called the agricultural revolution, out of which came several diseases we know today and that did not exist prior to that time. It's from that patriarchal umbrella that all the religions came, unfortunately bringing with them that shadow side of power and domination. I'm not denying that there is a positive and creative strain to all the religions. For example, they all share the universal call to love God and love the neighbor. But the kind of structures and institutions we develop, and you see this across all the major religions, need to be examined so that they can be oriented and our whole way of life can be more oriented towards the call to justice, which fundamentally means a call to right relating. That's the challenge. Now, these four summary points um, are elaborated at greater length on page two of the handout that, I, that you have been given. And so keeping these four in mind, you'll be able to figure out uh, the logic of the argument that I have on the second page. And therefore, friends, my conclusion, COVID-19, a new call to justice making, but it's justice primarily for our earth. We don't begin with us humans, we begin with the earth, we begin with creation. Justice for the earth, for all sentient beings with which we share the earth and share the web of life, and for all earthlings of goodwill, striving with discerning hearts to respond to these major challenges and calls of our time. Thank you.